during the process. So Ian, you got a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hold you off for a second because I want to go to Anne because I mentioned and give Anne a chance to kind of respond to some, what, what has been said by the panelists already and fill in a little bit with what we kind of cut her short for before. Sure. You know, since all the questions are about uh, pay for performance, let me not talk about pay for performance. That'll make a lot of sense. Um, but actually, the thing that I did want to add to this equation is that whatever the services are, it's critical to understand the population that you're working with. And whatever services that you present, whether you're paying for them through pay for performance or you're putting it in your operating budget, need to be services where the residents or folks will show up and take advantage of them. And I think this is one of those areas where health and housing come together in a, a very um, important intersection, especially within the realm of public housing, where we find that the, because the population has been so isolated, that they have experienced a great deal of trauma, that it's a highly trauma-impacted environment. And so one of the best practices that we are able to bring to the RAD environment, while there hasn't been additional resources to add um, expensive healthcare or other layers like that, we can bring our understanding of how trauma has impacted the residents and how the programs that need to be provided need to be provided through a lens that appreciates that. And so one of the things that I think has actually been critical for this work is to begin to either deliver services uh, through a trauma-informed lens or to look at some of the traditional services that have been provided um, and to think about them in a way that starts reframing uh, the situation, asking n not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you as a primary question, and uh, ensuring that we begin to build trust with our residents, since many of these funding streams have, over the past, actually done a lot of harm in retriggering folks who have experienced a great deal of trauma. So um, with respect to the question about the uh, residents or folks who actually are very expensive and have many chronic concerns. I think a lot of it does go back to trauma and it's one of those places where I think this intersection is particularly right. And that's really helpful and it's sort of this idea, you know, there's a really interesting sort of work, Nadine Burke has been working right. with you guys on this idea about trauma-informed care and thinking and, and, and the fact that you can do things like the um, adverse child experiences or what are referred to as ACEs as ways to sort of identify people who might have greater service needs uh, based on difficulties they've experienced in childhood, for example. Um, again, and, 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 and what I think you bring up a good point, Anne, is this, and, and it, it raises a distinction we should probably keep in mind in the course of the day, which is that there are strategies that really focus on things like trauma or adverse conditions or, or even disease management, whether that's a chronic ish, a disease or, or, or um, some, you, usually some, or some other disease, but it's this idea that that's sort of, you can manage those populations more effectively, keep them out of the emergency department, sort of think about how you can give them sort of better sort of wraparound services so that they're better treated. And then there's this other sort of category of health promotion, and that's really a lot what Lisa's talking about in terms of reforming these neighborhoods where you have access to fresh food, you're being trained for a job that, it's a, it, you know, working in a restaurant in New Orleans is a good job, and that's being trained to do that um, at at this whole food facility, if you ever get a chance to go see it, it's mind-bogglingly beautiful. Um, and it's just one of those amazing things where um, it was a part, it was a neighborhood that people were afraid to go visit and now uh, good friends of ours who, who live in the French Quarter, that's where they go shopping, you know? I mean, it's just re, it's re-knitting that whole, that, that whole part of the city back together across what were sort of um, uncrossable boundaries because it's made that place so so um, desirable and, and health promoting. So I want just for us to keep those two concepts in mind in the course of the afternoon as we kind of talk about these things. Um, and Ian, you've got like several of these you're gonna have to answer really quickly because we're running out of time. I wanna say just quick before you start though, um, 
Uh, Bob asked this question about um, performance context as it relates to the Community Reinvestment Act. So as bank regulators, um, the, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, FDIC, and the Fed um, do an analysis of what were the investable opportunities for a bank, um, what were the lending opportunities for them, and um, it's very similar for those of you who are in the health world to um, the community health needs assessment that hospitals are asked to do. And um, in my fantasy, someday those will be the same, those will be the same analysis, you know, those will be the same uh, uh, study. But um, we, we are doing at the San Francisco Fed a pilot that we're not sure exactly where it's going to land, but we have been including m more health data into those performance contexts so that when uh, Bank of the West is looking for investable opportunities in Fresno, they know that Fresno has the highest asthma rates in the country, right? And that there are some investments in Fresno to abate asthma that could be CRA eligible. So, I mean, these are things we're trying, we're, we don't know how these all come together, but we're working on it. Okay, Ian, go. And I want to be respectful of, of time. Uh, and, and I'll be here for the rest of the afternoon, so I'd love to dig into any of these questions uh, as the day progresses and, and at the reception. Uh, so, so I'll start really quick with the question in, in the front about uh, uh, the effect on, on the nonprofit sector. Uh, this isn't for everybody. It's not for every nonprofit. Uh, I will say, though, you know, I, I'd like to quote uh, Dave Wilkinson, who's the director of the Office of Social Innovation at the White House, because uh, I think this really sums up the, the potential benefit of, non of, of pay for success for nonprofits. And he says that, you know, we don't do a good job of, of honoring the sacrifice of nonprofit leaders when we require them to play the grant cycle game uh, every year to justify the continued existence of, of their organization uh, and to dedicate a huge amount of resources to marketing and development and all everything that goes into that, that process. So the beauty of pay for success is, and you can look at the uh, abode services example, this is a 6.9 six year contract with the boat services. They can use that funding, which they get up front, uh, to invest in their organization's capacity and to deliver services. Uh, so I think that's a much better way of supporting the nonprofit sector than the piecemeal and, frankly, fairly terrifying way that we do it now, which is to require them to play this, this grant cycle game. So I'm, I'm hopeful on that front. But again, not, not for every nonprofit. And uh, there are certainly downsides, which we can talk about uh, later. Uh, as far as the wrong pocket problem, a really, really important question. Uh, I will say that there's a $300 million uh, pay for success bill currently pending in Congress. It's bipartisan. Uh, from what I hear, it actually has a reasonable chance of passing uh, that would set aside federal resources to match state and local pay for success projects as success payments. So this isn't just technical assistance, project building work. This is money that would be set aside for outcomes that are delivered at the local level, supported by the federal government. So that is one way that we can address the wrong pocket problem, at least when it comes to the federal government versus local jurisdictions. And Bob, I do not remember your first question. I was asking more around, there's a real need for low and moderate income homeowners and renters to get, use pay for success to renovate and connect to health services. And we're seeing that in Baltimore, in particular, mm -hmm. where I live. So I was just seeing if you see it beyond just sort of more of a large institutional strategy for. Obviously, the transaction costs associated with these projects are, are fairly substantial. So uh, smaller deals are harder, bigger deals are, are easier. Uh, that being said, I, I think that there are opportunities, particularly with, with foundation support, to do smaller initiatives. Uh, but, but so far, the bias has been towards larger organizations with a lot of existing capacity and evidence to back up their efficacy. Um, but hopefully, over time, uh, that universe will be expanded to smaller, more innovative nonprofits that, that don't have the scale that some of those larger non nonprofits have. Let's switch to another three uh, questions from the audience. So again, you'll see the Federal Reserve staff walking through with microphones. So if you just raise your hand, get their attention, uh, and we'll take three questions for the panel here. We got one, one in the, uh, up here in the middle. Two, two down here. Yeah, go ahead and stand up if you can, so we can see you. Because I think they're. Um... Sure. Hi, I'm Bart Mitchell from the Community Builders. Since Anne and Lisa have struggled through how to 
get some great health outcomes accomplished without a organized pay for success um, paradigm. When you're up in the middle of the night thinking about how you wish that grocery store and the uh, medical clinic and the teaching kitchen all came together, what is uh, what you imagine? You wish I'd been there much simpler than the way you pieced it together that may be you know, inspiring question for all of us about how to make it simpler. We're going to go take the second question next. It's also for Lisa. I was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about the layers of financing or just give some examples. Well, let me just let Lisa jump in on those. Those are two great questions. Well, there's sort of related questions. I mean, I think, you know, for those of us who work on the housing side of life, and first of all, let me just say for those of you who sort of come from the banking side and, and thinking about CRA, I think it's a great idea. However, we work with one bank who doesn't get CRA credit for a letter of credit. It, they would have to be a loan. So there's like, they, they're so far here when we want them to be here that I think it's, it's really been a real challenge for the banks to try to sort of, you know, they want to do this work. And I think CRA has had a, a long enough history now that, you know, people sort of do it not only for CRA, but, you know, it's as, as risk adjusted investments, they, they perform well. I mean, they don't, they're not private equity, but they also are pretty riskless for the most part. So I think thinking about CRA more broadly is a great idea. I think we've got a long way to go, and I know, I know there are a few banks here who probably could fill your ears with, with regulatory stuff. Um, that being said, new market tax credit is about the only sort of knowable way to get sort of ans stuff that you're trying to get done, be it health, be it business, be it uh, retail, community-oriented, um, type development that's not housing done. It's, it's one of the very few resources, and it's a really complicated, really inefficient resource. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars in every one of these transactions goes to lawyers and accountants, and, and I, I, I hope in my perfect world it could simplify to be much more like tax credit financing, which everybody sort of knows and is, is a bit commoditized at this point. Um, it would be great if we could move these transactions more quickly and more efficiently. Um, and I wish that there were sort of a, a bigger pot of resources for the no, non-housing types of things that really do make neighborhoods and that are important. I think it's hard. I think you have to cobble it together from a combination of new market tax credits, uh, some, the dribs and drabs of CDBG funding that different cities and counties have. And then, you know, in New Orleans, we had um, some great, relatively small, but foundation support from things like... Um, uh, not, not James Beard, um, Newman's Own has a small foundation, but they, and they were able to put some money toward this. But there, there's no sort of magic bullet for this, and I think if we, you know, maybe the more of, of these projects that get done, maybe the easier they get. Maybe it's a, it's a factor of, of maturation, much like the tax credits have been around since 1986. And did you want to respond to that about what, what could be better? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, going back to RAD as a program, I think that, well, first of all, it's still a pilot. We're at the beginning stages of this. There are a number of housing authorities that have converted to RAD, but one of the things that we're learning is that the languages are different that developers speak and that um, housing authorities may speak, and just the frame of reference is different, and I think it... Um, it takes time and patience to be able to learn each other's language and to figure out how to fit together two established systems. Um, I also think uh, certainly more resources. It's actually the capacity required to do this is pretty significant. Um, it's only available to housing authorities that are, well, first of all, there's a cap, so it's not available to anyone else at the moment. But um, unless you're on, you're already lined up for it. But the, um, the challenge generally of um, be, being able to marry different programs together, I think, has been underestimated in this process. So more to. No, that's very helpful. Um, I'd like to spend, we were almost out of time, so I'd like to have each of the panelists have a last word. We're going to, just for two minutes, sort of, 
what 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 didn't we cover? What 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 you might sort of you see that later in the in the programming where there's going to be a little bit of discussion about using medical care dollars for this work, or thinking focusing on seniors is, is a topic for, for for later in the day. But what else do we need to get on the table, or just just uh, questions that we might be wrestling with, um, or something that you didn't get a chance to say? And Ian, why don't you go first? Sure. So I'll use my time actually to introduce the audience to two people sitting out there. Uh, Tom Manning, raise your hand. So Tom is working on a diabetes pay for success project here in New York. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go talk to Tom. And John Olson in the back, CRA officer for Goldman Sachs and a good friend uh, who knows everything there is to know about pay for success. Uh, Goldman Sachs is uh, the only bank thus far to get CRA credit for a pay for success investment. And if you'd like to learn more about that, I recommend uh, going and talking to John. Great. Thanks, Ian. Lisa? I think it's great that we're, we're beginning the conversation. I think it'd be really wonderful if there were um, somebody who wasn't, who would sort of take a look at this maybe from a study standpoint so we could really get some hard data on the ground. I think those of us who are sort of are, you know, in the trenches and who are practitioners sort of have our hands full trying to actually bring these projects to fruition. So if some of you people out there who are smarter, smarter than us and who can think these, you know, these in, in these ways and think about ways we can sort of track a project, be it, you know, a RAD, be it uh, public housing, I don't, you know, whatever it is, track it through and actually prove the outcomes, maybe we'd have an easier time convincing the money. Can, can I call an audience member? So Ingrid, can you respond to that point? Just to some of the work that you guys are doing at the Furman Center and can, can we bring a, a microphone down here? Thank you very much. Sorry, Ingrid. No, it's <laughs> Um, so, right, you're putting me on the spot because we, we haven't done this work yet. We have it planned, but we do agree that it really is important that we have sort of, we have growing evidence that there is a connection between housing and health, but we actually really don't have good rigorous evidence yet that tells us exactly what it is about housing that matters to health. And we have, um, you know, a number of, of projects, just budding projects and ideas for ways that we can um, link health data and housing data, track resident outcomes over time through linking administrative data and, and exploiting sort of natural experiments that will really allow us, we hope, to um, to persuasively, to you know, sort of rigorously demonstrate that there is this connection, that if you improve housing, that it will result in improvements in health. And I have to say, and, you know, when we're not the only ones doing this, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of interest in doing this, and there there really are new opportunities now with the availability, the, the broader availability of, of administrative data and the ability to connect data across housing and health. So, you know, although, you know, this is mostly a conference about talking about, you know, connecting practitioners in housing and health, it's really important also to connect these data streams and to connect researchers and, that are working on housing issues and health. So, you know, I hope at our next convening next year, I hope we will have some, <laughs> some you know, promising results. That sounds great. Thanks, Ingrid. While there is, I think, widespread concern about the risk of privatization of public housing that travels with RAD, I do think that one of the opportunities that is created out of this is an opportunity to break down silos. It's an opportunity for service provision, for cities working with housing authorities, for a way to bring a whole group of residents who under our current system have really been relegated to the edges back into the fold. And so there's some real opportunities there. Great, thanks, Anne. And I think what we really, you know, we were only able to scratch the surface on so many of these topics, but I mean, the point we were trying to make with this panel was that using existing tools today, people are executing on this vision of improving health through housing investments. And we think that's possible today, but we know that there are so many other things that have to happen in terms of changing systems, whether they're data, whether it's finance, outcomes-based financing, policies that have to change uh, that can make this easier to do. You, see, you heard the frustration on this table. We're trying to, we, we want to, the, in, in one year, El, maybe we'll talk about the data and, and have people talk about how easy it is now because we've managed to change those systems and make it better. So, um, so I hope we can pick up on some of these themes about people in place and these other issues that we talked about on the panel today later in the session. But please join me in thanking the panelists uh, and we'll have a break.